They've been reported at dusk or in the dead of night, in clearings amid still woods and fields in lonely farm country. Sometimes they come in silence, sometimes with quiet thunder. Often they leave marks in the earth, signals of their passing. They've been seen but fleetingly, and their extraordinary presence creates a frightening mystery. In fields from West Virginia through Wisconsin to Oregon are the beginnings of answers. of ground on a football field. Normal people saw the object that made it. It begins tonight's search for answers. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. On June 24, 1947, an Idaho businessman named Kenneth Arnold was flying his private plane near Washington's Mount Rainier. He saw nine disc-like objects moving rapidly along the horizon. Arnold said they moved erratically, like saucers skipped across a pond. Flying saucer thus became part of our language. After the Mount Rainier sighting, unidentified flying objects were reported all over the country, an astonishing number of them and the sightings have continued to this day. A chill morning in Mellon, Wisconsin. Quiet fields and quiet people. Yet something remarkable happened on the Mellon Town Road. Something that would have seemed incredible if it hadn't happened to people as down to earth as the town of Mellon itself. <laughs> Philip Baker works in a mill on the same job for more than 20 years. He's grown up here and passed on to his children a love for the land, a love for planting and harvesting his own crops, for cutting wood to warm the house in the long Wisconsin winters. He was an officer in his union once, but stepped down because it meant too much time away from his wife Shirley and their kids. Monty, Jeff, Jane, and John. The most important things to the Baker family are hard work and being together. They were together the most incredible night of their lives. It was March 13, 1975. I was carrying two cats. I was walking to the garage. And I got by this corner right by the house here. And I looked, and there was this weird object, funny noises, and it was really bright, and I didn't know what I should do. So I was going back and forth, and finally I threw the cat in the garage. And then I ran to the house around the corner, and I couldn't get the door open. When I first saw it, I was standing approximately right here, but I couldn't get too good of a view of it because the brush and the trees were in the way. So then I... Um, I went back into the house, and I got my coat on. My uh, two youngest boys and Jane were following me. We went over here to get a better look at the object that was sitting on the road. And my curiosity still wanted me to get a better view of it. So we walked down. Of course, the ground was covered with snow. And my car was sitting here in the driveway. And and of course, there were snow banks on the side of the roads, and there's where I got my estimate of the size of the object, approximately 12 feet in diameter, 
with also with the markings on, in the snow, uh, and I would judge the, the object at the center of it was approximately six feet high. It was uh, like a turtle. My two boys, my girl, started to proceed here closer. My girl told me not to go any closer to it. Yeah, she ran back in the house. And he was gonna go walking up to it, and I went back to the house and told my mom that he was gonna go up there and get closer to it. And she came out and she yelled at him. Uh, my wife came out and hollered at me and told me uh, not to be foolish and go any closer to it, not knowing exactly what the object was uh, on the road. And of course, I did get a very good view of it from here, as there was no, nothing blocking my vision on the, on the road. Montgomery uh, was looking out the upstairs windows where he got his view uh, of the object. And we went in the house and we called the deputy sheriff. And when the deputy um, said hello, it was a boom and it was gone. I went out and I couldn't see it anymore. The sheriff came and he saw nothing. That can be a pretty lonely feeling to have witnessed something incredible and be unable to produce evidence. Loneliest of all, perhaps, for the Baker children. They would want to tell their story to friends at school. But who would believe them? Oh, well, Monty, my oldest boy, he was all upset. He says, told uh, my other two boys, now, don't say anything. Don't say anything to kids at school. We don't want nothing of this to get out. And, of course, Janie was in tears. She says, well, I know what I saw. She says, uh, are you, are you trying to tell me I'm, I'm crazy or something? She says, I know what we saw. She says, don't try to tell me I, I didn't see anything, because she says, I know I saw it. And she was in tears and everything else that night. And, uh, of course, the undersheriff, I apologized when he left me off here, because I thought, well, now we didn't find anything. He said, he'll think I'm, I'm a little off, too. And he said, no, no, don't forget, just forget about it. And I said, well, let's, I said, okay, let's forget about it. And I said, but don't tell anybody then. I, I, matter of fact, I even mentioned him. I said, don't tell anybody. I said, just, just forget it then. Because I said, I didn't, let's drop the whole story. Mellon has a newspaper, the Weekly Record. Editor Jasper Landry knows just about everybody in Mellon by first name. I've known Mr. Baker for about 30 years. And uh, he and his family are, have been here a long time. And when this story broke on the UFOs, uh, he asked me not to put it in the paper because of the anxiety his family was being put through by callers and uh, uh, curiosity seekers. And uh, so I thought that I wouldn't. And uh, he was very appreciative. Uh, I honored his wish to not have a friend. The story got around anyway, of this country lane where the Baker family saw something big and metallic with red and green lights, something that was gone almost as soon as it came. I am George Ree, Mellon, Wisconsin. I am the undersheriff of Ashland County. On this night in question, I answered a complaint of Philip Baker, and I arrived at the site, and I investigated it, and I firmly believed that the Baker family did see a, a object. Sheriff Ree had good reason to believe Baker's story. He may have arrived at the Baker house too late to see anything there. But when he left, a second call came to investigate reported lights in the sky. Ree and seven deputies from two counties raced across country roads. Sheriff Ree would sight a bright object darting in the sky, call on his radio for another car to intercept it, and the object would dart away, sometimes to briefly join another hovering in the sky. One of Ree's deputies said the light given off by the objects was so intense he could read a newspaper by it. And when it passed over another patrol car, the police radio went dead. To this moment, no one knows what it was that George Ree and seven county policemen chased that night in Wisconsin. Big Chimney, West Virginia. It has been suggested that the overwhelming percentage of UFO sightings occur in small towns and rural farmlands for good reasons. The view is less obstructed, for one thing. The residents are more likely to be looking up at the sky, more sensitive to the changing lights above. 
was about 9.30. In the night, we were driving north on 119 towards Clendenin, and my wife saw some intensely bright lights in the sky, and she commented that this was the brightest airplane lights that she'd ever seen. I looked up, and there this big diamond-shaped object with big flat ends set right above the treetops. Carol Critchfield pursued his UFO to the spot where he saw it set down and found marks that could have been made by landing gear. Critchfield is a foreman in a big chimney chemical plant. He's not the sort of man who is often called on to take lie detector tests. But he knows how incredible his story must sound. I am Ian Criswell from the Criswell Security Agency in Wheeling, West Virginia. Myself and a team of investigative specialists conducted extensive polygraph testing of Mr. Critchfield. The lie detector, or polygraph, is a sensitive device for recording changes in body temperature, rate of breathing, electrical impulses in the skin, and heartbeat. Preliminary tests established normal parameters, which, if exceeded during the actual test, indicate deception. You know, this is the blood pressure pattern, this is a skin sensitivity pattern, and this is a breathing pattern. A lie detector test cannot prove whether or not Critchfield saw a UFO. It can only indicate whether he believes he is telling the truth. Is your last name Critchfield? Yes. Do you intend to answer all of my questions truthfully? Yes. Are you being completely truthful to the best of your belief concerning the object which you described and saw in the written statement describing the events of June 12, 1975? Yes. Are you being truthful when you say that in the first 35 years of your life you have never lied to a police officer? Yes. Are you being completely truthful when you say that you have no knowledge of how the burn spots and other evidence were created other than by the object described in your written statement? Yes. The test is now over. On the first question here concerning Mr. Critchfield's name, there was no reaction in any of the tracings. And the second question concerning the, uh, does he plan to answer all questions truthfully? Again, there were no reactions indicating deception. And question number three concerning the object that Mr. Critchfield uh, described in a written statement previous to this examination, there were no uh, reactions uh, significant of deception. And the question concerning the burn spots and the other evidence left by the object, uh, there were no reactions indicative of deception. And it is our opinion that Mr. Critchfield has told the complete truth about all statements concerning the object he cited on June 12, 1975. It would be unusual indeed if a man not noted for vivid imagination and guile could invent a story about a UFO and then control half a dozen involuntary body functions in such a way as to fool a sophisticated machine and experienced technicians. Much easier to believe that something extraordinary happened on a hilltop in Big Chimney, West Virginia. Something that touched Carol Critchfield's life and left him wondering. The uh, pocket transit also can be used... To get Some men, like Ted Phillips, are dedicated to finding answers for the growing number of perplexed people who have had UFO experiences. Phillips is an amateur scientist and UFO investigator. Neat little pocket penetrometer. Phillips has taken soil samples at dozens of reported UFO landing sites. He and his fellow investigators have amassed reports of no less than 60,000 UFO sightings in the past 30 years. Many of these were fairly easy to explain. Conventional aircraft, weather balloons, flocks of geese. 
but more than 900 cases remain unexplained. Phillips has an important ally in his search, the University of Kansas Aerospace Science Laboratory. It is the place he sends soil samples for analysis. Dr. Edward Zeller is the man in charge. Zeller believes it would be unscientific to ignore UFO reports and that the techniques of hard scientific analysis can be put to work finding answers. Medford, Minnesota. Medford provided Dr. Zeller with a test sample and a remarkable story told by Janet Kay provides the background. On the night of November 2nd, 1975, I was sitting here doing my homework and I looked out the window and right above the blue building, I saw a UFO come down out of the sky and um, it landed behind the building and behind the building is a football field, it landed there. There were two other witnesses, Janet's mother, Helen, and her brother, Jerry. A lot of people in town saw it. I, I don't know how many people saw it and told us the next day that they saw this thing up in the sky. In the sky. As we pulled around the driveway here, I noticed up by the blue shed over there that there was uh, something in the sky. So I pulled out of the driveway. And I said, turn down here, we can maybe get closer to it. So we just went over this way. And then you could just see it real good before the trees. It was definitely right there. And we just drove up here, and by that stop sign, the other railroad tracks, there's a fence across, so we couldn't go any further. And we just noticed it. It was just coming right in front of the trees, and we just stood here a minute till we saw it just glide over the top of the trees, and then it was gone. Well, a couple days later, after we saw the UFO go down, I saw a lot of people over here looking at something, so I came over here and I found this big brown spot on the, on the football field where the grass had been burnt. As you can see, the blue building is right over there, and the burn spot is right here. And it's right in line with the window we saw the UFO come down from. Now, this happens to be the sample from the Medford site, number two, which does show some strange luminescence properties. And so I'd want to make sure that the sample that I'm dealing with is not in itself radioactive. And I don't find that it is. I don't see any evidence of increased radioactivity. Yeah, at the time, it wasn't scary. It I, didn't frighten me when I looked out the window and I saw it. I, I didn't get scared or anything. But afterwards, when I realized that what I had seen was unexplainable. That's when it started to get scary. And then when they found the patch on the football field, well, that got a little, got a little worse. Furnace ready to be inserted here into the light chamber. And now we've inserted the sample, which is on the electric furnace, into the chamber. And we're going to start heating it. It's been six months since we saw the UFO go down. And as you can see, the bird spot is still visible. I, I wish I, I just wish I knew what it was. When, don't you think so? Yeah, I, I mean, if it was something, you know, from another country or something the army was putting up in the air, I wish they'd come and tell us that, I do too. that this was it and not just leave us out here thinking that it was something from some outer space place. I'd be satisfied with any kind of a explanation. Well, we're going to start off uh, here by looking then at the glow curves, which I ran about uh, two months ago on the Medford site. And if we look at the curve at the center of the site, we see that there is just a very small rise here. That is, the luminescence peak is very small. At the edge of the site, as we proceed along here, at the edge of the site, we discover the intense luminescence. Now, this luminescence that we are observing is apparently the result of some sort of radiation effect. It looks, at least, as though that particular uh, sample at the edge of the site has been subjected to some kind of high-energy radiation. If I had never seen a UFO, I, I wouldn't believe in it. 
I wouldn't believe, I wouldn't believe me if I were you. Because I, I, I have nothing to show you. I can't say, you know, I saw this. I just have nothing. All you have is my word. But there is more than just Mrs. K's word. In a recent Gallup poll, 15 million Americans claim to have seen a UFO. 15 million. The same poll showed that 51% of the adult population is convinced that flying saucers are real. For those who haven't seen one, this is a recreation of what Carol Critchfield saw on a hilltop in Big Chimney, West Virginia. The artist used the same technique that a police artist would use in recreating the features of a suspect from the descriptions of witnesses. And this is what Philip Baker saw on the town road in Mellon, Wisconsin. Helen Kay and her children saw this object land on a football field in Medford, Minnesota. The last systematic attempt by the U.S. government to investigate UFOs was conducted by the Air Force and was called Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book ended in 1968. The Air Force had by then investigated more than 11,000 UFO sightings and found explanations for all but 676. The Air Force seemed to have no interest in the sightings it could not readily attribute to earthly phenomena. Perhaps it's time to approach the question of UFOs again, without bias. For we can only hope that if we are being studied by aliens, it is with more thoroughness and care than we have focused on them.